thank you all so much for coming. Uh, the Institute for Children, Poverty, and Homelessness welcomes you to this webinar, Student Homelessness in Rural America. With us today are ICPH Policy Analyst Alexander Gwynn, NCHE Federal Liaison Christina Dukes, McKinney Vento Liaison for Gallia County Local Schools Sandra Plants, and she is from Ohio, and Program Coordinator at Hope House Homeless Shelter Angie Lyon from Indiana. Each of these individuals will walk you through their unique perspective on the multifaceted issue of student homelessness in rural America. There will be a Q&A session after all of the speakers have presented. To ask a question, please type it into the box marked questions at any time. These questions will be recorded by the moderator and will be directed towards our participants once all of them have given their presentations. The slides for this presentation are available to be downloaded in the handout section of the webinar, which is right near the bottom of, um, it says handouts two of five. Uh, without further ado, our first speaker today is ICPH policy analyst, Alexander Gwynn. Thank you so much, Alexander. Hello, everyone. Like G just said, my name is Alex Quinn, and I'm a policy analyst with the Institute for Children, Poverty, and Homelessness. And we're an independent policy research organization that focuses on family and child homelessness in New York City and throughout the United States. So too often, homelessness is viewed as an urban problem because that is generally where there are the greatest numbers of homeless families and homeless students. So because it's more visible in urban areas, policies and solutions typically center around cities and suburbs. But what does this mean for rural areas? Well, this means that rural areas often aren't able to adequately provide for their homeless student populations, and they can struggle to come up with their own solutions. So today, I'll be going over the overall trends in student homelessness in rural and non-rural areas which states identified the largest increases, how the growth in rural areas is sometimes at odds with trends in non-rural areas, where rural homeless students are most likely to be sleeping, and how it differs from where these students sleep in cities. And I'll be talking about funding disparities in rural school districts across the U.S. Now, if you remember anything from my section of the webinar, I hope that it's that rural student homelessness is growing at almost four times the national rate. So between the school year 2013-14 and 2016-17, the number of homeless students in rural areas increased by 11% to over 162,000 students, compared to just 3% nationwide. The question is, is this growth because there's an increasing number of homeless families, or is it because there have been improvements in the identification of rural homeless students resulting in higher numbers? Well, we would argue that it's both, and like with most complex issues, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Rural areas often have fewer shelters and service infrastructure, and limited access to public transportation and regular health care. What this means is that homeless families frequently must rely on personal vehicles and they can travel sometimes hours to the next town for a doctor's appointment or even to the closest Walmart. So disparities in both health and academic outcomes corresponding with homelessness are likely made worse in rural areas. This increase is spread out across the whole US and not just in the states that you typically think of as rural. Nationwide, 38 states identified increases in rural student homelessness. And in 35 of those states, rural student homelessness grew by more than the 3% national rate. Montana and Nebraska saw increases of over 100%. And the largest numbers of rural homeless students were identified in Texas, Georgia, Michigan, Kentucky, and North Carolina, predominantly in the southern states. But again, if you look at the map, growth is spread out throughout the whole of the US. This growth is a big deal because it often defies other statewide trends. For example, in 15 states, the number of rural students identified as homeless grew while overall student enrollment declined. 
So even while all students in these states were shrinking, the number of homeless students was increasing. And nine of these states saw rural student homelessness grow by more than 10%. In 10 states shown here, rural student homelessness grew while there was a simultaneous decline in non-rural districts. So in California, for example, homeless students in rural areas increased by 4%, while non-rural student homelessness decreased by 14%. Now I can see that this slide and even the next one are can be a little confusing. So if anyone has any questions, just feel free to type them out and then hopefully at the end of the webinar, I'll be able to come back to you and answer them for you. Often the number of homeless students in rural areas doesn't really match up with the number of all students. So basically the rate of homeless students in some rural areas is higher than what you'd expect when you look at the statewide rates of all students. For example, if you look at Arkansas, which is the first state highlighted here, rural students made up 30% of the total student population while making up 45% of the homeless student population. In 12 states, all of them highlighted, this number of homeless students did not align with the overall student population. And in three of these states, the difference was by more than 10 percentage points. The greatest disproportionality was seen in West Virginia where rural students made up 35% of the total student population, but 53% of the homeless student population. At ICPH, we often say homelessness is a national experience, but a local issue. This most certainly applies to rural areas where statewide rates of student homelessness mask these local dynamics. Nationally, 2.8% of all students were identified as homeless during school year 2016-17. This rate stood at 2.1% for students in rural districts and at 2.9% for students in non-rural districts. Eight of the 10 states with the highest rates of rural student homelessness had rates higher than in their non-rural areas. So take a look at Nevada right here at the top of the chart, where the rate of rural student homelessness was over twice as high in non-rural areas or throughout the whole of the state. So where are these students actually sleeping? Well, rural homeless students were more likely to stay doubled up compared to non-rural students. And one reason being a lack of shelters in the area. In school year 2016-17, 83% of rural homeless students were doubled up compared to 75% in non-rural areas. Only 8% of rural homeless students were in shelter, while 15% were in shelter in non-rural areas. And the demand for shelter also increased over this time period, with 13% more rural homeless students in shelter by 2016-17, as shown in this bar graph right here. This graph is showing percent increase over time. Now, what's probably popping out at you is this big orange bar showing the 43% growth in hotels and motels, which were paid out of pocket by families and not the government, as like in some places like New York City. This growth in hotels and motels, along with uh, the higher likelihood of students being doubled up, is because these areas often don't have access to shelters, and in some states, they're even cutting their shelter capacity in rural areas. Like Montana, for instance, rural homeless students were either doubled up or sleeping unsheltered and had zero access to shelters or even hotels or motels. Okay, so we've seen that there's a rapid growth in rural student homelessness at almost four times the national rate. It's disproportionate compared to other statewide trends and the local dynamics of the issue can often be obscured by these statewide rates. So why are we seeing this? One answer among many is that rural homeless students were less likely to be in districts that received federal homeless funding. Nationally, only 42% of rural homeless students were covered by McKinney-Vento subgrants, compared to 67% of non-rural homeless students. In 28 states, the proportion of rural homeless students covered by McKinney-Vento funding was less than half the proportion covered in non-rural districts. 
Eight states didn't allocate subgrants to any rural districts with homeless students, despite the fact that six of those states covered over half of their students in non-rural areas. For example, in Nebraska, no homeless students were covered by a subgrant in any rural district, while 88% of homeless students were covered in non-rural districts. This even despite a 200% increase in the rural homeless student population. This suggests that funding alone may not be flexible enough to accommodate the rapid growth in student homelessness, which represents many more challenges for states with large increases in their populations. Rural areas are underfunded and underserved in other areas as well. For example, rural homeless and low income children are more likely to be overweight, have diabetes or asthma, and have mental health issues like depression and anxiety than their house peers. And as you'll hear a little more later on, there's also a lack of access to healthcare providers. Rural areas are also less likely to have access to computers or internet than in urban or suburban parts of the country. This lack of access, coupled with the transient nature of homelessness, is a significant barrier to the development and education of rural homeless students. So how do we address such a large problem like this? Well, the first step in addressing rural student homelessness is to ensure that all school-aged children are identified and counted. If these students aren't identified, then they can't be supported. Equally as important is the identification and coordination of all available resources within communities for addressing the specific challenges faced by homeless students. The unique challenges faced by rural areas such as scarcity of resources, limited infrastructure, and large distances between school and home are obstacles in addressing the issue. Only by placing more attention on the local dynamics of homelessness can we effectively target solutions to address the problem. All right, that was Alexander Gwynn. Um, ICPH policy analyst. Thank you so much for speaking. Uh, we will hear more from you during the Q&A after everybody else has presented. Our next presenter is NCHE federal liaison, um, Christina Dukes. She's also worked with a program in Nebraska that she will also be talking about. So thank you so much, Christina. Thank you, Alex and G, and thank you, ICPH, for including me today. Uh, my name is Christina Dukes. I'm with the National Center for Homeless Education, and I'll be sharing a little bit more framing about the role of schools in addressing student homelessness in rural communities. And then also, I will be sharing some lessons learned from a relatively new initiative, you, you may or may not have heard of it, called the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program, or YHDP. In case you're not familiar with NCHE, we serve as the U.S. Department of Education's Technical Assistance Center for the Federal Education for Homeless Children and Youth, or EHCY, program. As you can see on the screen, we do have a number of resources that we make available to the field to support you in your work as you work with students and families experiencing homelessness. So we do hope that you will avail yourself of those resources uh, as the need arises. So I'm going to share just a little bit more research, but I really have a point in this, and it's to always make sure that we're remembering the important role education has in overall efforts to end homelessness, right? So not just within the school system, but with our cross-systems partners. What you see on your screen is one of the many very compelling insights that has been provided to us through Chapin Halls. Uh, Chapin Hall is based at the University of Chicago through their Voices of Youth Count. The Voices of Youth Count is a multi-pronged research initiative whose goal is to generate a more complete understanding of youth homelessness in America. And as part of this research, Chapin Hall found that certain subpopulations of young people are at a higher risk for homelessness. So that's what you see on your screen. So more specifically, young people who would be considered low income had a 162% greater risk of homelessness while youth with less than a high school diploma, or GED, had a 346% higher risk of homelessness. So as you can see, the lack of a high school credential 
place youth at a much higher risk for homelessness than any other risk factor that was examined in the research. And when we consider issues of intersectionality, so for instance, an African-American youth who hasn't graduated high school or a low-income LGBT youth, we see that that risk multiplies. The research reminds us that the value of education and living wage employment must be given intentional focus and investment in all community efforts to address homelessness, and that includes in rural communities. A little bit more research and then we'll get down to the nitty gritty of practice, but uh, what you see on your screen uh, basically mimics what Chapin Hall showed specific to youth homelessness. The research from Chapin Hall joins a well-established body of research that supports what's commonly known as the education premium, and that basically means the more you earn, or excuse me, the more you learn, the more you earn. So the higher your level of education, the higher your income, and the lower your likelihood of unemployment. Now, this relates very closely to issues of housing affordability and homelessness. The National Low-Income Housing Coalition issues a report every year uh, known as uh, or titled Out of Reach, and this report demonstrates that low-income workers continually have difficulty affording housing in communities all across the country. So again, simply put, if we want to address uh, youth and family homelessness, we must help young people get the education and training they need to secure and maintain living wage employment. What you see on your screen basically supports what Alex has shared uh, with us, but at the national level. Basically, young people ages 13 to 17 and ages 18 to 25 experience homelessness at almost the same rate in urban and rural communities. So while the overall number of young people experiencing homelessness in areas may be higher because these communities are more population dense overall, the rates of youth and young adults experiencing homelessness across rural, excuse me, rural and urban areas are in fact very similar. Now what you see, the trend is very similar to what Alex shared, but looks a little different because the data that Alex shared about primary nighttime residents came from school districts, whereas what you see on your screen came from the Voices of Youth Count, which included young people age 18, or excuse me, who were, were minors, so under the age of 18, but also young people ages 18 to 25. So while rates of youth homelessness in urban and rural communities are almost identical, statistics on where youth in homeless situations stay at night do show a very significant differences. So namely, stays in shelter are much more likely in urban areas, while staying with other people because you don't have another place to go is, a, is much more likely in rural communities for some of the reasons that Alex has already mentioned. All right, so let's start zeroing in on some, some of the uh, trends that we're seeing from a recent initiative called the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program. I'd like to share how some of the lessons that are starting to emerge from that work um, are taking shape in particular in rural communities. So YHDP is a relatively new funding stream from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. HUD has awarded YHDP grants to 21 communities across the country to date, and eight of, or excuse me, nine of those 21 communities are rural. So HUD is placing a very intentional focus on addressing homelessness in rural communities through YHDP. When communities receive this funding, they must develop and implement a coordinated community plan to prevent and end youth and young adult homelessness. Now, the YHDP model overall, if you're wondering sort of what, are, what is the underpinning paradigm, uh, it comes from the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness Youth Homelessness Framework. And what that framework says is that community must, communities must address four key areas to provide young people with the supports they need to make sustainable exits from homelessness. And you see those, those pillars of that model on your screen. So they are stable housing, education and employment, permanent connections, and well-being. 
I mentioned YHDP because it is an active area of work right now where different systems, so that would include the homeless response system, child welfare, schools, uh, juvenile justice, and other systems are working together to help homeless youth. Now, I would undoubtedly <laughs> assert that schools are a critical partner in all community efforts to address homelessness, but they are certainly a critical partner in rural areas, and I'll be sharing some of the reasons for that in the next several slides. Now, lest you think that, um, well, what, what does this mean for me? I'm not a, a rural, or excuse me, a YHDP community. Well, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development is set to announce a uh, round three of YHDP uh, any day, which will include an additional 25 communities, eight of which will be rural, so we should hear about that any day. Congress did also fund a fourth round of 25 communities, and there is a possible uh, YHDP round five that is part of the fiscal year 2020 federal budget negotiation happening right now. So all of this to say, if you are not yet a YHDP community, there may be an opportunity for you to become one in the future. And a shameless plug, if you'd like to get that announcement when it's hot off the press, that HUD is accepting applications for round four, please visit the NCHE website and join our listserv. So here are our lessons uh, from YHDP. So first and foremost, one of the resounding lessons is that efforts to address homelessness in rural communities must look different than they do in urban or suburban areas. Uh, some of the challenges that are unique to the rural environment, Alex touched on this briefly, is that there's no central location for basing services where you have a critical mass of people and capacity to serve. Rural areas also tend to have sparse or no public transportation systems and systems of technology or other infrastructure. And then finally, rural communities tend to experience a sparse or spread out presence of public systems and funding, including many of the homeless response and human services uh, supports that are needed for our families and students experiencing homelessness. This is where schools come in. They are a critical partner in addressing student homelessness in rural areas for many reasons. So first of all, while other public systems may be lacking in rural areas, the public education system is one of the broadest reaching public systems that interacts regularly with children, youth, and families in homeless situations. So this means that schools, in effect, can serve as the eyes and ears for the homeless response system whose reach into the community may be limited. Also, not only are schools interacting with students experiencing homelessness every day, but they're mandated by federal law, the McKinney-Vento Act, to identify and serve these students in school. Having said that, especially if you are a school representative, you know this to be very true, that no one system, and that includes the school system, has the capacity to address all the needs of young people experiencing homelessness. So schools absolutely need help. And this is where partnering with other systems to wrap varied supports around students, schools can help young people be prepared to enter into adulthood with the education they need, again, circling back to that theme, to secure living wage employment. All right, so some general strategies that I'll suggest and then on the next so slide, excuse me, some very specific lessons learned in Nebraska. If you're working in a rural community to address homelessness among youth and families, I'd like to make several recommendations for strategies to consider. First, it may help to divide large rural areas into regions for partnership and service delivery. Also, as mentioned, it is important to partner with schools to identify students and to refer them to resources across systems, across systems. But it's also important to support their educational goals. So not just to look at schools as a place where students are identified, but to look at the issue of education as one that needs to be supported intentionally for the well-being of the students who are being served. Many students experiencing homelessness are first generation and low income, and so they may have nobody serving that role of being the voice of information and encouragement that education is in fact still an option for them and that there is help along the way if that is a path that they want to pursue. 
And so again, we have to ensure that educational access and success receives the attention it deserves in all coordinated community responses. Also, uh, explore innovative housing options. And I'll give an example of how Nebraska is addressing that on the next slide. Also, consider combining brick and mortar and virtual service delivery. It may, it simply may not be possible to establish physical service points for all the supports students experiencing homelessness may need. And also, again, if lacking transportation, even if you can establish those supports in a brick and mortar fashion, uh, it may be difficult for families and students to get back and forth to those services. And so consider what role virtual service delivery might play via the phone or maybe even the internet in areas like coordinated entry, systems navigation, mentoring, mental health supports, and the like. And then finally, do blend funding across programs and systems to maximize reach. And again, I'll give an example of that uh, from Nebraska. All right, uh, a shout out, first of all, to the good people of the Nebraska Balance of State Continuum of Care and their education partners. Nebraska is one of the round two communities that I've been working with as part of NCHE's provision of education-focused technical assistance to the site. So the area where we're seeing the most traction in partnership is in the coaching project uh, that was recently funded through YHDP. This is essentially a systems navigation project, which if you're not familiar with that term, it is basically what it sounds like it is. It is a project uh, that funds a group of system navigators who work with young people to navigate systems that may be unfamiliar to them, such as housing, education, workforce, mental health, and the like. The coaching project is partnering with Nebraska schools to make sure that students identified as homeless in school are connected to coaching support. What is especially helpful is that the coaching project was operational prior to receiving YHDP funding and was supported by various funding sources, such as Chafee Independence Dollars, Education and Training Vouchers, state funding, and more. And so this means that the coaching project can serve young people who meet both the HUD and education definitions of homeless. And in the area of housing innovations, the balance of state found itself struggling with rehousing people rapidly, or rehousing youth and young adults, in some of the more remote rural areas. And so what they've done is they've submitted a waiver to HUD to be able to use hotel vouchers to extend the reach of their short-term housing interventions. All right, thank you uh, for your attention. I hope this information was helpful. If you'd like more information, please do check out those resources on your screen from NCHE and Chapin Hall. Thank you so much, Christina. It was wonderful hearing um, your presentation and we will hear more from you with your questions at the end. Um, but our third speaker today is McKinney Vento liaison for Gallia County Local School, Sandra Plants. She is calling in from Ohio. So thank you so much, Sandra. Greetings from Southeastern Ohio. I am the McKinney Vento liaison, as she said, and work here in Gallia County Local Schools in Southeastern Ohio. Our rural homeless families um, face many challenges, as you've heard are mentioned by our previous panelists. Um, what you see in our region is typically out of generational poverty situation. We'll see families that have been evicted from their home every few months because of not being able to pay their rent. And now that they're homeless, they will double up with other families or friends in the community. There is definitely a lack of jobs available within rural communities, and this leads to homelessness. Additionally, there is not many low-income rental homes or HUD housing projects available to homeless. So typically, we do not have homeless shelters either, or if we do, there's very few beds, just like the HUD housing, and it will have very long wait lists. So you'll see most families doubled up. 
rural areas, again, don't have soup kitchens available like urban areas will have. So there is a definite lack of free food distributions. As you heard mentioned before, there's no public transportation available. So with limited number of agencies as well, working with the homeless, there's always a scarcity of resources and funding available. And what we do have, again, is never enough to address all the issues that our homeless population and poverty face. Within these last few years, we have really started seeing an increase in what we call situational homeless, where the family um, has had something in their income change that hadn't been homeless before. We feel like this can be contrib attributed to our epidemic drug use or loss of jobs. We have plants, uh, coal fire plants, other plants and businesses that have shut down or have dramatically decreased their employees. As a culture in rural families, typically they don't relocate to find new jobs. They will stay in their community where family is located, thus leading to more families being homeless and doubled up. Transportation in rural areas. Um, as mentioned earlier, there's no public transportation for families. So we have to resort to um, our homeless population. We'll have to ask other people for rides. This can be a very humbling thing to do when you're homeless to ask for help. They have a lot of pride and this is difficult. For the school system, busing is our mode of transportation. So in rural areas, we do have typically longer commute times to and from schools and districts in, that have smaller square miles. Our district alone is 460 square miles. We say we drive to Phoenix, Arizona and back every day. Typically, that will be anywhere from an hour to 90 minutes one way commute for our students. Therefore, when we have to change a route to pick up a new student, a homeless one, that can dramatically change the length time of a bus route. Additionally, we may have to create two to three bus transfers for a student to get them to their school of origin. And that's even more true if the student is residing outside the district but wishes to stay in their school of origin. This can make the ride time for a student upwards to two or three hours one way to school. With these challenges, working with other districts as their advocate for homeless, sometimes will create a barrier when it's not supposed to be. Just because of the distance we have to travel, the number of transfers, coordinating pickup or drop off locations and times. I hate to admit that, it almost pressures our homeless students and families to, again, transfer to that new school instead of remaining in their school of origin, which we know would be best for their stability and school project progress and success. So we try to get creative and offer solutions. One thing we've done is offer gas cards to families that have reliable transportation to get their child to school or at least to a bus drop off or pick up. I've been able to pay for that out of my federal Title I dollar set asides. However, most of our families don't have that option as they do not have reliable vehicles. So our district does have a couple of non-emergency contract service providers for hire Again, I've used some Title I funds to pay for these services. However, it's per mile, so it can be very costly um, for a student. I know I've paid upwards of eight to $10,000 sometimes a year for one student. But when all other avenues have been exhausted, we will provide any mode of transportation necessary to get kids to and from school. 
Identification. Again, we've heard by the previous presenters that this is the key to success of helping our homeless youth. Some of the ways that school districts can increase their identification if they're not already using these. I hope to provide some ideas that we have found to be helpful in our district. We have centralized our enrollment of all students to one location instead of in each building. That is done out of our county board office and that is where my office is located. Additionally, I have trained our registrar in McKenney Vento Law and Signs of Homelessness. She is also the secretary that will flag the McKenney Vento eligible students within our state educational data reporting system. I've also created and added a student residency questionnaire as part of two packets. The first one is our enrollment packet for every student that is new to our district, we'll fill that out. And annually, as we're getting ready to start school, it will go home as part of the beginning year packet of forms that parents fill out. This helps us to pick up any new student that is not new to our district, but maybe their residency has changed since we last did this or over the summer and we have not caught through other means. As McKinney Vento liaison, I do ensure the training of all staff member every year, and this helps to increase our identification by training administrators and teachers. But more importantly, you need to think about your support staff, your guidance counselors, secretaries, cooks, and custodians. Sometimes kids will talk to them when they don't talk to a teacher or principal. But particularly important, and my best referrals come from my bus drivers. The bus drivers are the ones who see these kids and where they live. They're the first ones to notice if anything about their home situation has changed or if more people are living there and doubled up. They are my eyes on my kids. So I created a homeless referral form. It's just a simple one page form that the employee will put a student's name that they believe is homeless, check mark what they believe to be the situation, and if they wish to write a short narrative. Next, I'll get those referral forms and follow up on all of them. First, I'll check to see if they're already identified in our system, which I would rather get multiple referrals on one child than none. And there I go on to determine whether they're McKenney Vento eligible. And if so, I will follow up with resources and support to that child and family. Another place that I've found that has increased our identification has been working with our other community agencies and partners. I have trained several of them in McKenney Vento law if they did not know of it and I continue to work very collaboratively with these agencies. I assured and made sure these um, members of businesses and organizations have our posters, brochures, or any business cards that they can hand out or use. I gave them a referral form as well. So if these agencies do any intake or see a homeless family situation, typically they will follow up with a referral form to me or even a personal contact and vice versa. I'll call them if we have a mutual client that I feel like can benefit from their services. That leads me to networking. Networking of resources and rural communities has been vital to the support of our families, as in all communities. However, one benefit that I do believe rural areas have is our small town culture. In Ohio, in the southeastern part, we are also an Appalachian cultural area, and I believe that is to our benefit. The people within typically are very tight knit community. That means we, we know everybody in our community, even our homeless families. The school, which I'm a part of, is generally the hub of rural communities. Most people 
go there for events and sports and and come out. So providing services with the school and the agencies is definitely one thing that we have going for, as the panelist mentioned earlier. In these rural communities, you will see members of agencies and businesses supporting all the work of the other agencies. There's also a high level of trust and strong relationships among the people, the business partners, and even our homeless clients. They believe that we're here for them and we've got their back. That is, unless you break that trust. So it is very important in small towns how you interact and you handle your homeless clients or work with other members in your community. Again, rural areas, there's typically very few service providers, whether those are service agencies, civic organizations, businesses, area churches, even some of our sh coffee shops and restaurants and stores will serve our homeless community. So with few providers doing the work collectively, these members have to do work very well with each other. Within their scope of services that we provide to all our families. If we cannot offer a service to them, we typically know who can and refer them to them. Also, it's easier for us to track um, services to our homeless families and not double up on services since there are fewer providers. One way that I was able to connect with these agencies and providers so that we can network has been to find out where they're meeting. Typically, they'll have a monthly or bi-monthly meeting. And I've, as the McKenney Vento Liaison for School District, has been asked to speak about homelessness at their meeting. Other times, I just make sure I'm present at their meetings. Together, this group has created a community-wide contact list with all the services listed that we offer. Um, this brochure has been great to me as McKenney Vento liaison to service our homeless families and provide them with all kinds of contacts. But most importantly, I use this brochure with my homeless families and youth who are in need of all types of services. I believe this is a great opportunity because it's a very non-threatening way to offer support to our families. They may not want to say they're homeless, and I typically never use that word. They don't mind saying that they're poor. There's no stigma around being poor. Typically, everybody in small towns are. So this is one way that I can support them with a brochure that has all the contacts and services that they may need. You also need to observe within your community, where are the public places that people frequent, especially your homeless population? And make sure that you put up McKenny Vento posters or brochures with the types of services that your business may offer to homeless families and put it in a spot that can be easily visible or picked up by your homeless or people in poverty. Sometimes you have to get really creative and think outside the box. Um, I don't want to leave you just with all of the challenges we face in homeless, I mean, in rural communities with for our homeless, but also some takeaways. One of them that you've heard Christine mention earlier was the Youth Homeless Demonstration Project program. I was on that program in Southeastern Ohio. So don't be afraid to think big and go for those federal grant opportunities just because you're a rural community. And we heard about several other rural communities going to be a part of the next round. So if you haven't applied, get together with some agencies and fill that out and become a part of that. Again, the Youth Homeless Demonstration Program in our area provides for unaccompanied youth with emergency housing. And again, those are typically hotels or motels. 
but works them toward rapid rehousing and other supports that the young unaccompanied youth may need to be stable. And it's truly been an amazing part of our region and a blessing to these youth. Listed there, again, are some other ideas that have been established in our community that I feel like can be easily replicated in other communities. The first one that I'll talk about is our Code 10 Ministries. This was actually established out of a need that we saw and several area churches came together and created a non-for-profit set up at one of local banks where funds can be easily accessed by a debit card and these churches collect money and contribute to this fund every month. This helps to pay for hotel rooms and sometimes food for homeless families or domestic violence in the after hours. We saw this as an increasing problem in our community. Our police officers had no one to turn to in these after hours when social service agencies were closed during nights and weekends. The reason is called Code 10 because as a police officer, if I have any listening today, you will know over the radio when you hear a Code 10, it means officer needs assistance, send help. So that's just what we did. Another idea was God's Hands at Work. It is an establishment where people saw a need and got busy and they found an old church building and converted it into a distribution center to help anyone in need with free items. The founders of this nonprofit will also accept any in-kind items or food that is shelf stable and any type of funding. This has been a tremendous resource um, that takes care of our families in need and our poverty. Again, it takes a village, but if everybody contributes, it does go a long way. Probably one idea that I'm going to mention that has received some national attention, not only in our community, but in others, is the Snack Pack Program. I've heard it called Backpack Program, but it's where community members um, support um, monetarily or shelf-stable food items. These are then packed in backpacks or bags and distributed to area schools. These are ready to go home over the weekend with kids that are in poverty and that are homeless. Um, this is really important as our kids really rely on the free school lunch program. So over the weekend and on holidays and in the summer times, our homeless children do not look forward to these breaks as other families do. They're gonna wonder where their next meal is coming from. So the snack pack program has definitely aided and helped our children during these times out of school. Another creative solution that we came up with was one of our major department stores closed in our community, and it was the only store that accepted clothing vouchers from our job and family services. So our educational service center was able to secure some of those funds from our welfare department and was able to offer summer school to all students in our community. That is two different school districts, grades K-12, so about 800 students took advantage of this opportunity. As an attendance incentive, if they came 85% of the time, each student received $200 worth of online back to school clothing. This was paid for and shipped straight to their house. Additionally, the family that came to order, they got a backpack full of school supplies, about 40 to $50 worth, and we gave them back to school haircuts that day. Another initiative that I want to talk to you about that I feel like can be easily replicated and we're hoping that others will grab onto this idea. We created a McKenny Vento liaison peer-to-peer -peer network in our five county 
areas with all those school districts. This was a, a goal from our Youth Homeless Demonstration Program that Christina talked about as well. The school had to get together and come up with a way that the educational system and our community partners created wraparound services and keep a well collaborative um, relationship with each other. So to create this though, I did seek the support of our Ohio Department of Education Homeless Liaison, and she was very supportive of the idea of us creating a regional organization. This network is now out on its own since the Youth Homeless Demonstration Program. We were in the first round, so our portion has been established and implemented, and we are now on our own. Now I take the lead on this network, and I coordinate meetings with the service providers and the McKenney Vento liaisons in the school districts. I'll have an agenda, we share information through email, etc. Again, we're hoping to replicate this model across our state and hopefully to those of you hearing about it today. As a McKenney Vento liaison, you're typically the only one in your school district that does the work to provide for homeless students. A lot of times these roles change and you don't know where to go to for help. So creating this network has been life-changing, not only for ourselves, but for our homeless families in our school districts. We again have five counties and that's 20 different school districts that come together to participate. A lot of times we'll invite our superintendents or other administrators to join us for these meetings. We've been meeting about two to three times a year at a central regional location. It usually lasts about half a day. In our meetings, we've looked at our homeless data through gallery walks. We've listed topics that we feel like we need more support or information about. Then we've prioritized our topics for future follow-up meetings. We'll take one topic and maybe a small minor topic to consider each time that we meet. Again, these meetings are open forum. So there is a flow of ideas sharing and we're building really good relationships with each other um, and share experiences and ideas and even offer very creative solutions to each other if somebody has issues. Again, we have a wide range of experience levels. As some of our McKenney Vento liaisons have been doing this for about 20 years, and some of those are brand new to the role this year and need a lot of support from the rest of the group. At our last meeting, I offered the suggestion of creating a Google folder for the entire region. Within it, everybody can access all types of resources that we found we all need. We can put in sample forms or videos for training our staff. We can put in brochures and posters and other things there, and it can be easily accessed by all members. Another great aspect of this network that has been cultivated is instead of always calling the Department of Education State Homeless Liaison for all of our questions um, that we're not sure about, it's made it quicker and easier to contact somebody more locally and get them on the phone immediately. We know our state liaison is very busy. So this kind of support helps again, to build and deepen those relationships with other McKinney-Vento liaisons in other school districts within our region. We have a very transient homeless population in rural areas, and they'll travel back and forth between all these school districts. So we may need the assistance from the other district McKinney-Vento liaison when our families are located within their district, and they want to stay in their school of origin, or maybe they are having to move there or transfer there. So now that we've cultivated those relationships and it has seemed to expedite and help our homeless 
families get services quicker and maybe um, to service providers in that new community at a faster rate. Again, with having the brochures and knowing about everything that's available and if we're doing similar service across our five county region in 20 different school districts, it's only, only gone to aid our families. Thank you for listening. I hope that I've addressed not only some of our challenges in our rural community in Southeastern Ohio, but I've given you some practical and creative solutions that can be replicated in your own community. I look forward to addressing any of your questions later. Okay, thank you so much, Sandra. Um, just one note before we move on to Angie Lyon. I have noticed um, we are going a little bit long, so I would like to say to our participants, and it will say in an exit interview as, or not interview, sorry, exit email as well, that uh, this webinar will be posted up on our YouTube page following the, um, following the presentation. So if you have to step out, uh, the information will still be available to you online. So um, thank you so much for uh, everybody who is still here or who has joined us. And next up is Angie Lyon. She is a program coordinator at Hope House Homeless Shelter in Indiana. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, thank you, G, for, the um, for allowing us to participate in this. So my focus this afternoon is really just um, from a person provider's perspective and the frustrations that we face serving um, rural homeless families. So again, I'm the program coordinator at the Hope House. We're a homeless shelter in Greenfield, Indiana. We're just about 20 miles east of Indianapolis, um, our state capital. And um, we serve Hancock and three counties bordering um, Henry, Rush, and Shelby counties which are all considered rural communities. Um, we accept men, women, and children, and we have about a 35-bed capacity. So um, a little bit about when a family would enter shelter. We see generally by the time they get to us, as the other presenters have identified that they're couch surfing or that they're doubling up. And by the time they get to shelter, they're generally in active crisis. And that is that there is just so many components to their lives that they need help with. Um, and generally, most of our residents we see, they have burnt what we call burnt every bridge. So they've lived with grandma, they lived with great aunt Sue, they've lived with friends and family, and they're really at no other option. Um, and so then we transition into shelter. And so we're facing not only um, that there's a little bit of a stigma for them personally entering shelter, but then they're concerned um, about our judgment. Uh, and then we have to transition into a, a environment where there are more rules and structure than they've generally had before. Bedtime is probably one of the hardest. Um, it's we ask the families to be um, home by eight o'clock every night and in bed by 8:30, and um, that can be challenging when you have people that are working in factory environments or fast food, um, and they're just not used to that kind of structure. Transportation is something I think we've all identified as a huge barrier. Um, affordable housing in our community is pretty much non-existent. It's easier to house a single person than it is a family, and I think we could probably all agree on that. And um, there's a lack of available resources. So we just don't have the same resources that, a, that an urban environment has. Um, and we have to work a lot harder to get them connected to where they need to be. So schooling. Um, we generally try to keep the kids in their home school. However, when we serve com um, communities outside of Greenfield, it, transportation becomes challenging and bus time, um, as Sandra mentioned, we don't want the kids to be on the bus any longer than necessary, and so we end up transferring. 
sometimes transferring can take time. Um, we recently served a family who was from um, inside Indianapolis and the Department of Child Services was involved in their case. And so we couldn't really allow any gap time. The girls had to go to school. There wasn't really an option. And so getting that transferred and implementing McKinney-Vento, we couldn't do it fast enough. And so fortunately, this family had someone who was willing to drive the girls back and forth to school. But it was an hour to an hour and a half of travel time one way. Um, and so affording gas became extremely challenging. And so they, our community has been really good about implementing it when we need to, especially within the districts here in our own county. But again, it can be challenging. So access to healthcare, and, and these slides pretty much um, replicate, so I, I'll kind of skip around a little bit, but um, we see a lot of families who are underinsured or not insured at all. Generally, the children are insured, um, but maybe mom and dad aren't, so they don't have the same um, need, if you will, to getting to doctor's appointments or making sure that they're doing preventative health care. It takes time out of the schedules of both the parents and the children. Um, and so you have, we see most of our residents are paid by the hour. So taking that half a day, sometimes a whole day off work can drastically re in, impact their income um, and they're already living paycheck to paycheck. So it's easier for them to just not do anything until it's an absolute emergency. Um, accessing specialists, so if we, need um, a pediatric cardiologist, our community is not able to help, so we have to send them to the city. We have no access to public transportation, so um, sometimes we can get them a Medicaid cab that will take them one way, but then getting them home becomes a challenge. Um, inpatient and outpatient, our local hospital is wonderful, and they do what they can, but they get very they're not able or equipped to do, take care of complicated pediatric or adolescent situations, and so they refer them out. And our closest hospital is probably 45 minutes away. So again, another barrier. Um, and then consistent health care, which I touched on briefly before, but it's not really at the forefront of um, a parent's concern or a child's concern to go to the doctor yearly or get regular checkups, they're just not doing it. And then there's a lack of follow through. Um, and as I mentioned, I touched on this a little bit already, that you see a lot of the same in dental care, but as we work through dental care, it becomes even less of a resource. There are fewer dentists than there are doctors. Um, and then those that are able, are willing to see our kiddos, um, their Medicaid panels are full. So then we, they're not able to accept them. And again, it kind of repeats the same theme that I've been talking about is there's, you know, there's lack of providers and then they're not willing to take the time or they can't take the time. And then there's no follow-up and consistency. And lastly, mental health. Um, we have seen an uptick or maybe we're getting better at identifying mental health concerns for both pediatric and adolescent um, health, health insurance. All of our mental health providers require insurance of some kind. And again, it's the same issue we have is that the panels are full. Um, our local, the only person who has a pediatric psychiatrist in our county, um, their panels are full, and they're, even if we could get them in for some reason, a spot would open. It's a six to eight week wait list to just get them seen, and that's for an initial appointment. We recently had a young woman, she's nine, and she, um, 
identified as wanting to go inpatient. She was really struggling. She had been inpatient before, um, and she asked her mom to take her to the hospital. The closest hospital was in southern Indiana, in Vincennes, and it was a two and a, it's a two-and-a-half-hour drive. Well, mom doesn't have transportation, so we had to round up a friend. Um, and then mom left her in the hospital for 10 days and then went and back to get her. So then you have parents in distress because they're, they're not staying with their children. Um, and it creates a unique dynamic, and it's very sensitive. And again, repeating the same things, we see um, parents not able or can't afford to take time. Um, and there's a, a lack of follow-up and consistency. So these are all things that we really are striving to implement, to work harder, to teach them not to um, just go on emergent basis, but really create a plan and stick with it. Okay, thank you so much, Angie. Um, and thank you to all of our presenters for your wonderful presentations. We are now going to be moving into the Q&A section uh, with some questions that uh, you in the audience have had. If at any time you have a question that bounces off the question or if you think of a question before the Q&A um, occurs, feel free to put it in the question box and we will ask your question. So, um, First off, there's some questions about data. So um, Alex and Christina, uh, if we could just generally talk about where the data comes from and how it's defined. Um, what is the data source for uh, respectively, and I'll, I'll ask uh, Alex first and then Christina, what is the data source specifically for the Chabin Hall study and for the ICPH report? Um, and how is rural defined in those reports? and what definition of homelessness is being used in those reports. So Alex, first. Well, for the ICPH study, we used the uh, US Department of Education data set, which was a, uh, a big data set of all school districts across the country. And um, combining that with uh, another data set, we were able to, to drill down into like, the, uh, the local level. So we could then tell which school district was in a rural area, which school district was in a suburb, in a city, in a town. And um, as far as how rural was defined with those data sets, um, well, it was, rural was defined as anything that lay outside of a geographical area that was considered urban, while also having a population less than 2,500 residents. So, um, and uh, could you, what was the other question, please? No, that was it, that you did. That was it? Thumbs up. Yeah. All right, cool. And then, uh, Christina, do you need me to repeat the question or do you have this? Uh, no, I've got them. So for sources of information, um, the uh, so I, I'm not part of the research team, just so we're clear. I just have a lot of respect for the research um, and have familiarized myself with it. But it's a multi-pronged approach. So depending on the actual finding, um, it may have come from, so first of all, the, the largest source of data was from a household survey. I believe it was part of the Gallup poll. There was a brief uh, youth survey and housing survey that was added to uh, the national Gallup poll survey that's conducted um, via the phone, and so that included thousands of uh, respondents. In addition to that, uh, Voices of Youth Count worked with about 22 communities to really dig into youth-specific uh, counts in those areas, and they also conducted in-depth interviews with, I believe it was about 210 young people experiencing homelessness that were identified as part of, part of the broader uh, research efforts. In terms, and, and again, one thing that's different from the data that Alex mentioned is uh, Alex, the data Alex is referring to is from school districts and so includes school age children and youth, whereas the voices of youth count is for um, youth that are minors, but I need to remember what the, I think it was ages 12 to 17, or not 13 to 17, and then also young people ages 18 to 25. The definition of homelessness was fairly inclusive, so it included uh, what may be referred to as literal homelessness, but also couch surfing. 
In terms of the definition of rural that was used, I'm actually not sure, so I may need to follow up with that. Okay, thank you so much, Christina. Um, our next question uh, will be directed at uh, Sandra and Angie and, and Christina. Um, it's less data focused, um, but in your experience, are homeless students from uh, non-rural areas moving to rural areas? Have you seen that in your communities? This is Sandra. Um, we have seen a, maybe a slight increase of people moving from cities to rural areas, but typically I haven't seen a dramatic increase in that. This is Angie. So I would I would agree. Um, we kind of in our intake process have a set of questions that we ask, and so the families have to qualify um, by being connected to or um, having some I guess having some connection to one of the counties we serve. So whether they're working there, they've lived there, um, a friend or family will vouch for them. So I would say it's rare. Um, they're generally from these communities, have been, their parents were raised here. Um, and, and I think Sandra kind of touched on that a little bit is that they're generational. So we see maybe their grand, the grandparents live here. They may have moved away for a short period of time, but they're back. This is Christina. I actually wouldn't have anything to add. Okay, thank you. All right, um, this goes to anybody who, I know that Sandra mentioned hotel vouchers, but um, if any of, uh, if Christina and uh, Angie work with hotel vouchers as well, at, um, one of our um, participants would be interested to know is, does your hotel voucher program have service providers who are familiar with working with trafficked youth? And if so, do you have recommendations for working with rural trafficked youth who used ho who used hotel vouchers? I can start in that, um, so speaking again, based on my knowledge of the work of the Nebraska Balance of State YHDP work, um, they they did have to, or and I should say they are awaiting the response from HUD about their waiver request to use hotel vouchers uh, to extend the reach of uh, housing intervention. So hopefully that will be approved. I think, again, as we've discussed throughout today's webinar, there's just a need to be able to extend reach into the more remote areas, and hotels is one way to do that. I do know that YHDP sites are required to focus attention on a handful of special populations and young people who are at risk of or being trafficked uh, for sex or labor are in the among that list of special populations. I don't know that I, I myself have particular insights about young people who are trafficked specifically in the rural context. Maybe one of my co-presenters does. So this is Angie. We have done hotel vouchers. I should say our um, county trustees actually um, house those primarily and different service providers are able to make referrals, but our hotels have actually stopped accepting them and because the rooms were trashed when the families would leave or, or any individual would leave. Um, so that has become a new challenge where we could house them generally for 24 to 48 hours. We can we no longer have access to that resource. As far as with trafficked youth or trafficked people in general, um, Indiana is really focusing as a state on trafficked individuals. Um, we recently opened here in our, our very own county. Um, a church group got together and opened a center for trafficked women. They're now accepting trafficked men. So we are doing better as a community as far as trying to educate ourselves, but I would say we still struggle to identify um, people who would be in that risk pool population. Okay, this is Sandra, and I don't have any, um, I guess, 
hotel vouchers. Our program has been through the Code 10 Ministries where um, there's a debit card and it's a police officer that is trying to assist these families. So they're definitely going to know or see the signs of trafficking youth and going to be very cognizant of that. So if they felt like that was an issue, they would definitely take matters and do that. Through the Youth Homeless Demonstration Project, as Christina had mentioned, where we try to get our unaccompanied youth, some of which may have been trafficked, that um, they work with them for the emergency housing in hotels and a rapid rehousing. They would definitely be trained in signs to look for and get these children the help and the support that they need. Wonderful, thank you to you all. Um, so the next question is, do any of you work with local public libraries to provide services for homeless families and children? And if so, which services do you work with the library to provide? This is Christina. I can mention that I know, uh, so in addition to the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program, initiative there is an initiative that is also happening in a number of communities called 100 day challenges which is uh it's an approach used by the rapid results institute to encourage communities to really give sort of an intense period of commitment to an issue to see that progress can be made and i do know in some of the meetings with those communities that the public libraries were uh, at the table and part of the discussion i know that they can provide supports in a number of ways and that even just posting materials about available supports as people experiencing homelessness may go to the library to access uh, public facilities or the internet or uh, email or whatever. So um, I know that they're at the table. Maybe um, some of my co-presenters might chime in with additional detail about what that looks like in their area. Uh, this is Sandra. In our community, our library, kind of like our school district, is the hub of the community. So if parents can get there, again, it's centralized within our community. So if they have transportation there, our libraries do post some of our homeless information as well as have some of these contact resources resources available, but as Christina mentioned, they are a hub for people to go and access the internet, to check emails, they'll copy papers, they help them with maybe accessing other service providers, but the children can um, do their homework there in the evenings when they don't have maybe a place to go. So it's a, it's a nice, safe, warm place to be sometimes and provides for our youth. Okay, wonderful. Um, uh, just one more. Um, can, uh, can you recommend uh, McKinney-Vento training videos and materials for school administration? Um, before our participants answer, I would like to note that uh, an organization called Schoolhouse Connection, and I believe Christina's organization and CHE as well, they do have um, materials on their website. And um, so at least in terms of websites, you can at any time, if you need these resources, you can email our info at icphusa.org email, and we will be happy to provide you with resources. But uh, in terms of other resources, do you have any that you have used specifically um, to inform your audience, or well, not just audience, but um, your your audience as McKinney Vento liaisons and administrators. Well, as the McKinney Vento liaison for my school district, I agree with what you said that I use the um, NCHE videos. They have a lot of great videos and resources that can be easily accessed by our staff. Um, on every kind of topic that you can imagine that you might have, and even addressing some things that our high school students may face that would be maybe a little more applicable to them than an elementary school. 
There's also some videos on there um, for your support staff that would be maybe a little more applicable. There's short videos and even longer videos depending on the amount of time as an administrator you may have. And this will fulfill your obligation for training of your staff. And uh, just to piggyback off what you just said, pretty much any time I'm looking up anything even closely related to McKinney Vento, it's the NCHE website is my, my first stop, hands down. This is Christina. <laughs> you guys have just given us great um, free publicity. So thank you. Uh, but just to piggyback, so, so we really are charged by the Department of Ed to support state coordinators and local liaisons. You guys are two of our key uh, stakeholder audiences. So please do check out our website. We offer webinars regularly and other um, helpful materials. We have a helpline that you can call or email with questions. Uh, and also our, our colleagues at Schoolhouse Connection do really good work as well. Okay, well, um, that will be our last question for the afternoon. I would like to thank all of the presenters for sharing this information with us and all of the participants for joining us today. Um, if you have any other questions, uh, the, I, I didn't show this in full earlier, but on the slides that you can download from handouts, the email addresses of all of the presenters are available to you. Um, also, if you want any other information from ICPH, you can email us at ICPH, or no, sorry, <laughs> at info at ICPHUSA.org, or um, there is other contact information on the ICPHUSA website. Uh, just to close out also, we would like to make note that uh, ICPH hosts a conference every two years called Beyond Housing and registration is currently open. So if you would like more information on that topic, you can go to the website on the last page of the um, PowerPoint presentation that is linked in handout. So thank you so much again and I hope that you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. So long. <laughs>